T9C got the fucking juice. Phil is the new goal. T9C got the fucking juice. Phil is the new goal. What's going on, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the JT Sports Podcast. I'm your host, JT. Tonight, man, we got to talk about star receiver Rasheed Rice is in some really serious legal troubles right now they put a warrant out for his arrest the dallas pd they're out looking for him and he has to turn himself in or they're gonna come get him and i've been so in the dark when it comes to the rasheed rice lamborghini crash because i didn't think nothing was going to come of it You know, this is just your normal, typical, everyday thing that you see these NFL players do, blowing away a -a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. And pretty often, they get into these legal issues and they get nothing but a slap on the wrist. However, this situation, though, it's looking pretty bad. He could do some time. We're also going to be talking about the Las Vegas Raiders. Their owner, Mark Davis, just gave them the green light to go all in on training up for a quarterback in this year's draft. They're eyeing Jaden Daniels, but can they get Jaden Daniels? Do they have what it takes to pull off a Jaden Daniels trade? J.J. McCarthy, everybody has an opinion about him. Scouts, NFL executives, they love him. Me, a lot of you guys. We're not really so high on him, but I figured out why NFL scouts and execs are hyping this dude up. I got my prospect breakdown, my scouting report on him, and then we also are going to dive into some college football. It's been a little bit. The Miami Hurricanes, despite how down Miami football has been for the last couple of decades, it always surprises me. The amount of Hurricane fans that I always bump into for him, like, for Miami to be as down as what they've been, there are a lot of Hurricane fans that exist in this world, and it really surprises me. Shadur Sanders is being so slept on, man. 
Ah, uh, ESPN released their top 10 returning quarterback rankings, and you won't believe where they ranked Shadur and who was ranked above them. And the media is just throwing so much disrespect towards Shadur Sanders' way. The Carolina Panthers, I got thoughts on their free agency moves. The Jacksonville Jaguars finally recite the first round pick. They extended star pass rusher Josh Allen. But did they overpay for his services? Before we dive into tonight's show, hit that like button, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Remember that we are not just a YouTube channel, we are a podcast, and you can find every episode, including this one, available in audio format on all podcasting platforms. Apple, Google, Spotify, Amazon, wherever you get your podcasts from, the JT Sports Podcast is available. Shout out to everybody in the live chat. Shout out to my guy, Floyd Donnell. He says, what's up, man? Falcons fan here. Man, shout out to the Falcons. Y'all got a lot of things to be excited about right now. Follow me on social media. You can find us on X at JT Sports underscore underscore and on Twitter. Well, Instagram at JT Sports underscore. And once again, make sure you leave us a five star review on Apple and Spotify if you enjoy tonight's episode. Before we start off, here's a word from our partner, Mint Mobile. Does it piss you off how much you pay for your monthly phone bill? Why are you getting frustrated when our partner Mint Mobile has plans as low as $15 a month that give you unlimited talk and text on the nation's largest 5G network? Stop getting frustrated with how much you spend on your monthly phone bill and go to trymintmobile.com slash JT Sports in the description and pinned comment down below to get access to premium wireless for only $15 a month. That's only $15 a month. Month. Switching to Mint is easy. It only takes 15 minutes to do. If you're pissed off with how much you pay for your monthly phone bill, switch to Mint Mobile today and go to trymintmobile.com slash JT Sports in the description and pin comment down below to get premium wireless for only $15 a month. Stop getting upset with how much you spend on your monthly phone bill and switch to Mint Mobile today. I'm going to be honest with you guys. I was not really paying a lot of attention to this Rasheed Rice incident because I didn't think nothing serious was going to become of this. Normally, we see these NFL players pretty often get into a lot of legal issues off the field and they get nothing but a little slap on the wrist. And I thought this was going to be another one of these cases, but... This situation has turned really serious. The Dallas PD put out an arrest warrant for Rasheed Rice due to an accident he was involved in. And March 30 or March 31st, him and a friend were racing. He had a Lambo and he ended up getting into a six-car accident. And then him and the fellow driver that he was racing with, they fled the scene. And then we would soon discover later that he had some marijuana in the car. He also had a playbook in there, some jewelry, a check. And the people that were involved in the crash, how are they? Are they all right? They had some minor injuries. So this thing isn't Henry Ruggs bad, but it is still pretty bad because with the warrant that they put out for him, he has one account of aggravated assault, one account of collision involving serious bodily injury, and six counts of collision involving injury. It's not looking good for Rasheed Rice. And I'm not a lawyer or a legal expert, but the maximum prison time that he could receive is pretty lengthy. Even if he does find a way to beat these charges and he gets off with a little minor punishment, some community service, pays a fine, gets put on probation, he still is going to have to face consequences from the league. And he definitely is going to miss at least four games. You know the NFL, when it comes to their punishments, they normally don't really F off. They make it hurt. So I could see him having a five-game, four-game suspension. KC 
you get Marquise Brown in free agency, and everybody's excited thinking about the dynamic duo you could have next year with Hollywood and Rasheed, and there's a strong possibility that we may not even see Rasheed Rice be able to suit up week one next season for Kansas City. I mean, at this point, there's a good chance that this dude may not even be free. He may be locked behind bars watching the Kansas City Chiefs play next year. And it's just really surprising how these NFL players are given a -a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. And they just make bad decisions. I understand that they're humans. They're not robots. They make mistakes just like how me and you make mistakes. But what would give Rasheed Rice, you know, the wherewithal to think that it was a good idea to be street racing? Go to a racetrack. You know, why are you trying to live life like you're playing in GTA 6? And then you're racing with weed in the car? That makes absolutely no sense. If you're going to race, at least race with nothing else in the car that could get you in more trouble. This just isn't a good look for Rasheed Rice all the way around. He is young. Young people make mistakes. And he didn't kill nobody like Henry Ruggs did. But he did get some people hurt due to his actions. He went on Instagram, he accepted accountability for his actions, which is a good thing, but you effed over Kansas City. We don't know if you're going to be free, and if you are able to beat this, you're going to miss some games. They're going to have to draft another receiver pretty high because they don't got a lot of depth at receiver. At least anybody that you can look at right now and be like, oh, yeah, that dude could definitely be a serviceable number one for a few couple of weeks. Or at least until Rasheed Rice can get back healthy or not healthy, but he can, you know, serve whatever punishment that he receives. If he's able to beat the legal battle in the courtroom, the NFL definitely is going to give him a suspension. The question just is how long? So until he returns, Kansas City, you're going to have to find somebody who can fill his role. It definitely isn't Kadarius Toney. You're going to have to find that answer in the draft. You got Marquise Brown, but he's just a really high-end number two. He's a really good Robin. For Marquise Brown to be really effective, he needs a Batman. He's a really good sidekick. Rasheed Rice could have been that Batman in this situation but with him you know potentially facing years behind bars and a potential suspension we don't know what's going to happen with this dude and Kansas City you just have to go ahead and go about things in the draft as if you might not have him available you might not lose him for a few years but you might be without him definitely for a couple of games Could you get A.D. Mitchell? Could you maybe trade up for a Brian Thomas Jr. maybe? Hell, is Kansas City trading up for Marvin Harrison Jr. out of the question? You may look at Rasheed Rice and say he was solid and he could come back and shake back from this, but if you could get Marvin Harrison Jr. for two first-round picks, how do you not pull the trigger on that if you're Kansas City? I don't know what you would do with Rasheed Rice. Maybe you move him to the slot or whatever. Maybe you move Hollywood to the slot. Who knows? But it's not looking good for Rasheed Rice, bro. And I know he has to be looking back on this, feeling really, really stupid. Because the Lamborghini looks really nice. It really does. And you want to be able to enjoy the merits of your hard work. And what's the point of having the car that goes that fast if you're never going to have the opportunity to put the pedal to the metal. But at the same time, you're an NFL player. And it's easy to look at these guys and say, we would do a lot better if we were in their situations. But, you know, a lot of people have their own ways of going about living life. The only problem with Rasheed Rice in this situation is that, you know, you can't use the open world as a racetrack. 
the world isn't GTA. If you want to race, rent out a racetrack, rent out a private location or private property to do it. Don't do it out in the open for people to get hurt. When you're driving, not only are you responsible for your life, but other people's lives as well. That's the whole point of having these long virtual driving classes to teach you road safety, driver safety. You know, looking out for yourself behind the wheel and the safety of others. Rasheed Rice just, this just isn't a good example of what an NFL player should be setting. And this is why when you see players around draft time that have some character concerns, why ESPN and the NFL Network spend so much time reporting on it. Even if you have a clean rap sheet, you've never gotten in any trouble at all. You could have a guy like a Henry Ruggs or a She Rice end up doing something stupid like this. And I promise you, this isn't the first time he's been doing this. Normally, these players, when they street race, they've been doing it for a while. It's just now they got the luxury cars. They got the money now. So nine times out of ten, they're going to win the majority of times. It doesn't even make any sense trying to challenge one of these dudes to a race. Now, in this situation, the other dude had a pretty high-end luxury vehicle also, but that's not really the point. The point is that Rasheed Rice made a stupid decision. He hurt his team. He could be hurting himself in terms of his freedom. And this is definitely one of those things that just makes the NFL get a bad rap. When people think about NFL players and how they conduct themselves off the field, you know, I kind of get a little upset when I see the people making the jokes the NFL stands for the National Felon League because not a lot of people in the league are knuckleheads. Most players know how to conduct themselves in a pretty well-mannered way. But you do have guys who tend to like to have a little bit more fun than others. They take it a little bit further than what they should. And they go off the deep end and they don't think about the consequences in the process. And apparently that's what looks to happen to Rasheed Rice in this situation. All I can say is I'm hoping and I'm praying for the best for him in this situation. I'm hoping for the best for the people who were involved in this, that everybody's okay, that everybody can make healthy recoveries fully, nobody gets no long-term damage, so maybe the Chargers won't be, or the charges won't be as severe on Rasheed Rice, so hopefully everybody's in good health, and Rasheed Rice, you know, he can take this situation, not really have to face any prison time, hopefully, because nobody got severely hurt, and he can learn from this, grow from this, and not repeat this again. Because, I mean, you would hate to see somebody with such a promising future throw all this away on just a stupid adrenaline rush. Because that's really what it is. It's just an adrenaline rush when you're trying to race. But, man, this does, it doesn't look good for Rasheed Rice, people. It really doesn't. We can just hope for the best. Las Vegas Raiders owner Mark Davis has given the team permission to trade up for a quarterback in this year's draft, and they got their eyes set on Jaden Daniels. Antonio Pierce and Jaden, they go back to Arizona State when Herm Edwards was the head coach there, and Jaden Daniels was early into his college career. And they got a really good bond, a really good relationship with each other, and I really want to see this happen. I would love to see... Jaden Daniels suiting up for the silver and black next season. The only problem is that how are you going to be able to get Jaden Daniels? There are a lot of things that need to happen for the Raiders to get Jaden Daniels. And it's not even about them being able to fork up the assets to even get into a position to trade up to land Jaden Daniels. But you got to hope that the commanders don't drive Jaden Daniels. Is Jaden Daniels going to pull an Eli Manning? That's the only way the Raiders have a chance at getting Jaden Daniels. Jaden Daniels has to pull an Eli. He has to tell the Washington Commanders, listen, I like you guys, but 
Nothing personal. Don't drive me. I want to play for the Raiders. I got a good bond with Antonio Pierce. Let me be a Raiders. Maybe the Washington Commanders say, you know what? We'll trade down. Or maybe they say we're just going to take J.J. McCarthy. And then they'll have to trade up with the New England Patriots. The Patriots, they are a team that they don't need to touch a quarterback this year. All right. They don't really have a good roster. They don't got a lot of talent at receiver. You got some questions with your new offensive coordinator. They definitely are a team that for the right price, they'll fork up that third overall selection. The Raiders got to give up three first round picks. The problem with this trade, if you're the Raiders, is that you don't care about giving up the three first round picks, especially if you have the opportunity to fix your quarterback situation. Jaden Daniels, if he ends up reaching his ceiling, he could be one of the best quarterbacks in the game. And he definitely is one of those QBs that if he reaches his ceiling, he could go toe to toe with Patrick Mahomes. You have a first round pick this year and the next two drives. Is that enough to entice New England to want to accept your offer? Minnesota, they could give up three first-round picks, but they have two first-rounders in this year's draft, 11th and 23rd. For a team such as New England, I don't see why you would be thrilled to accept the offer like that. You got three first, but they're all for the next three drafts. You want first-round picks that you could use either this year or the following year that could turn your roster around immediately. You know, having three first-round picks for the next three drives, I mean, at least you could say you got two first-rounders for the next three years, but I just need a little bit more value than that. The Raiders aren't going to be willing to fork up Max Crosby. Maybe you can ask them to give up a receiver Maybe you just ask for Jacoby Myers back. Maybe you try to get an offensive lineman from them. You got to find a way to get some value out of the Raiders more than those three first rounders because I don't really think that's enough. You see, the only time a lot of first round picks looks enticing is if you can package those up with first rounders for the same draft. You got two, three first rounders for 2024. Use those to trade up for the number one pick this year, for example. For the Raiders, the trade up from where you're sitting right now, you're going to need Jaden Daniels to pull an Eli, put you in position to find a, a trade partner that's willing to accept three first rounders spread out that length. Because if I'm a general manager, if I'm accept any trade for a top five pick, and I'm asking for three first, I need at least two in the same draft. It doesn't matter if it's this year or the following year, but just three first rounders, the next couple of years spaced out like that, not a big fan of a trade. And even if Jaden Daniels manages to get the commanders not to take them, what if the Patriots don't want to trade down? What if they want to draft them? Then what? Is he going to have to pull the Eli men in twice? Can it work that way twice? Eventually, a team might just have to say, you know what? If you want Jaden Daniels, you you just going to have to flat out trade for him. And maybe they just might up the ante. It, it just would be a miracle if the Raiders could find a way to land Jaden Daniels. Realistically, the only way this could turn out in the Raiders' favor is if you trade up with Arizona at four. They possibly could be okay with three first-rounders, maybe an additional second. The Patriots, okay, they pass on Jaden Daniels. J.J. McCarthy, they like him, and they take him third overall. Drake May already is off the board because he went to the commanders at second if they're not okay with Jaden Daniels. But Jaden Daniels is just such a good fit for the Washington commanders and Cliff Kingsbury's system that it's hard to envision a world where they do pass on him. And even if they do, Drake May most likely would still be the pick. You're going to need Drake May and Jaden Daniels to still be on the board by the time the Patriots turn the pick. Because, listen, if one of those guys goes, another team is going to take the next one. 
you're you need JJ McCarthy really to go second overall to the commanders. With Drake May and Jaden Daniels still on the board, the Patriots are gonna have to pick between one of those two. If Jaden Daniels pulls the Eli Manning and says, Hey, don't draft me to the Patriots also, then the Patriots can say, you know what? Okay, we're cool with Drake May. It's fine. And then at four, with you trading up with Arizona, then you land Jaden Daniels. But I, I don't even see how any team would be enticed to accept any offer from the Raiders that doesn't include a high-end player. You might have to fork up a Max Crosby to end up getting one of these picks. Normally, when you trade up to get a pick this high, you got to give up multiple draft picks and maybe a high-end player or maybe a solid player. The Raiders... It doesn't seem like they're willing to part ways with any of the players that they have right now because I'm pretty sure the Jets would give up the 10th overall pick for Devontae Adams. It may be overpriced, but they're willing to do anything it takes to appease Aaron Rodgers. The Raiders aren't willing to trade Devontae Adams. If they're not willing to trade a guy like Devontae Adams or Max Crosby, they're not going to get Jaden Daniels. It's just really hard to envision a world where Jaden Daniels doesn't go second overall to the commanders. And even if he does, you know, still stay on the board for the Raiders to maybe snag him at three if they can trade up for him. I don't think they got enough to entice a team just based off draft capital. So that's my thoughts on the rumors about the Las Vegas Raiders trying to just go all out on getting Jaden Daniels. Listen, it's like we can dream. I know Antonio Pierce really loves the brother, but they got no chance in hell of getting Jaden Daniels at all. The quarterbacks in this year's draft, man, they need to avoid getting drafted by the New England Patriots because... If any of these top quarterback prospects such as J.J. McCarthy, Drake May, Jaden Daniels, Michael Penix, or whoever get picked by New England, their career, just go ahead and automatically throw it in the trash, is going to be wrapped for them. The Patriots are probably the worst situation that any rookie quarterback can go to. First, they don't have a good offensive line, all right? Their offensive line situation is really shaky right now. They don't really have any decent receivers that you can look at and say, oh, yeah, like, you can't consistently move the chains. You can't consistently get open. I mean, Kendrick Bourne is nice. He's a decent wide receiver, two, wide receiver, three, but you need more than that for a rookie quarterback. You got Pop, DeMario Pop Douglas, who had a really promising rookie season out of the 904. I like him a lot, but that's not enough. I mean, you got two solid running backs with Mondre Stevenson. You signed Antonio Gibson in free agency, but you got one of the worst offenses in the NFL in terms of talent. And your offensive coordinator, Alex Van Pelt, who was the OC for Cleveland in the last three years, this dude has only called plays one time in his whole entire career being the coach in the NFL. And the one year that he called plays was with the Buffalo Bills back in 09, and they had one of the league's worst offenses. The best thing they did that season was come from behind against New England. That was it. There's not a lot of reasons for New England to draft the quarterback this year other than Maybe the draft class next year may not be that good because you can't tell me that, well, JT, the Patriots may not be in this situation again next year to draft a quarterback this high. BS. Bro, th this team is not good. You mean to tell me that the Patriots are going to win six, seven games and have a top seven, top eight pick? Yeah, I doubt it. Strongly doubt it. This team, if anything, they might end up having the number one overall pick. New England this year, it would be in their best interest to just take the third overall pick, trade down and get more assets. Trade down with Minnesota. You get the 11th and 23rd selection. That would be a good trade. You get the opportunity to select two players that could have immediate impact for you right away. 
And then in the later rounds, you know, you can continue to find some diamonds in the rough. My problem with New England drafting a rookie QB this year is that there's just a lot of moving parts that they have. And for a rookie QB just to be thrown in a situation as bad as New England, you're pretty much just throwing them out to the wolves. Unless you're going to say, we're just going to sit you for a whole season behind Jacoby Brissett, but it's hard to imagine that happening. The only time I can really recall the team staying committed to sitting their rookie QB for the whole entire year, letting them develop behind the vet, was Kansas City only because they were good in the 49ers. When you're a good team, you don't get put in pressure moments when you're like, okay, F it. We got to throw the young guy in there because we ain't got nothing else going for us. In New England, I don't think they're one of those franchises that if they draft a young QB, they can just rush him out day one with how bad of a team they are. Jaden Daniels and Drake May, they may be able to run around and run for their lives, but you don't want them getting effed up so early into their career where they end up getting traumatized and then you stunt their development because they're paranoid to stay in the pocket because the offensive line don't let them get clobbered so many times. New England just needs to chill. Plus, you got a defensive-minded coach. And it's not like you are bringing in a Kyle Shanahan or a Sean McVay disciple. You're bringing in a dude that only called plays one year. And the one year he was calling plays, the Bills offense was one of the worst in the league. So if I'm Jerron Mayo, I'm staying away from drafting a quarterback, at least in the first round. Second round, let's say Michael Penix, Spencer Rattler on the board. Okay, I might throw my hand at one of those guys. But early on, first round, third pick, nah, man, they they need, man, they, they need to chill because – any QB going to New England, you're walking into a situation where you got to turn nothing into something. And who do you know? They they got Juju Smith Schuster. Do y'all even remember Juju Smith Schuster, bro? I damn near forgot this man still played football. I haven't heard of Juju Smith Schuster ever since Kansas City. Pretty much, man. The rise and fall of Juju Smith Schuster is crazy. Like y'all really think? Do you really think? Drake May, Jaden Daniels, or any young QB in this draft could survive and actually have a productive rookie season with the arsenal in the passing game that New England's going to be giving them? Man, going to New England for a rookie QB this year should be considered no man's land. If anybody should be pulling an Eli Manning, pull an Eli Manning going, going to New England, bro. Gerard Mayo, I like him, but... He's only been coaching for five years. Like, uh-huh? That, I, I want New England to succeed. I really do, but I don't know about New England. I, I really don't. Like, we could be seeing New England in for some really bad years. And it may not just be a couple of years. It may be for a couple of decades, bro. Like, huh. J.J. McCarthy has NFL fans and NFL executives and scouts split. Because you have NFL fans who believe that this dude sucks, he can't play at all, he shouldn't be a first-round pick. Meanwhile, NFL GMs and scouts, they just see this dude as all-world. So I'm here today to give you guys the truth about J.J. McCarthy. Is this dude as good as what NFL executives are making him out to be? Or is this going to be another situation like we saw with Mitch Trubisky where the fans were actually right on this one? After watching J.J. McCarthy's film, and I watched every throw of his from last season, I'm not going to lie, I was really surprised. And I kind of now understand why the hype for him from these NFL guys is so high because... The first nine games of last year, they looked really good. Okay, J.J. McCarthy was looking really good inside of the pocket, avoiding pressure, throwing with accuracy. He was starting games out 7 for 7, 8 of 8, 12 of 12. One damn game I watched, he was 12 of 12. 
and he can play really well in structure. And you know, with a lot of these head coaches, they want a quarterback that sticks to the script. You know, they don't want a quarterback that goes off script and starts trying to do his own thing. They want him to play within the structure of the offense. You know, go through your progressions, one, two, maybe third progression, nothing there, checking down, or run with the football. That's what J.J. McCarthy does a really good job at. But he also does have the ability to get outside the pocket and extend plays, and he is really good throwing the football on the run. And also what surprised me is he's a really good athlete. He's really slippery. That's the best way I can put it. Like, he's slippery. Like, guys are just slipping off him. He's stepping up in the pocket, throwing guys off him. Really big dude, really athletic. This dude can run, and he can make you miss, too. Okay, he definitely is going to be one of these quarterbacks that could come into the league and have around 800, maybe 1,000 yards in the season on the ground. He makes a lot of tight window throws also, which is a big plus in the eyes of NFL evaluators. Every time I watched J.J. McCarthy play this past season, there wasn't a single tight window throw that he didn't really have too much success completing. He makes those tight window throws look so easy. And to make those throws, I guess you do have to have a good sense of anticipation unless you just have a rocket for an arm. J.J., he does throw with really good velocity, and I love the way that he throws the football. To me, he throws the football with a really good base, and it just looks so pretty. He throws really nice, tight spirals, and he's a rhythmatic passer. What does that mean? That means that when he starts the game out fast, Let's say he starts out 4-4-4, four, four, four. you get him going early with maybe a bubble screen, a few slants, maybe an out, right, a out route, you get his confidence high early, he starts the game out hot, he's going to have a good game. But if he starts the game out slow and he struggles early, he's going to have a bad game. And that goes into my big weaknesses and red flags with J.J. McCarthy is that Oftentimes, when he got out to a slow start, it was against teams that had good defenses. Penn State, Ohio State, hell, even Maryland on the road, he struggled against them. He struggled against them. And he struggled against Bowling Green. He had two really bad interceptions. When I'm assessing a quarterback prospect, I'm looking for what are you going to do when you're going up against the best teams on your schedule, especially when you're playing with the kind of talent talent that J.J. McCarthy was playing with. He played on the best team in college football this past season. So with that, there's no reason why you should be struggling against teams with equal talent. When you're not looking good against the biggest teams, well, the biggest games on your schedule, that's a huge red flag for me. You should look good against these inferior opponents like Eastern Carolina, Rutgers, and Indiana, Michigan State, because they suck. They suck. But when you're going up against the best teams on the schedule, that's your chance to prove yourself. Even in the college football playoffs, he didn't look good. On paper, he had a good game against Alabama, but he looked nothing more but a game manager to me. And Washington, that may be in. The worst game of the season we saw out of J.J. McCarthy, minus Penn State, and Penn State wasn't even that bad. It's just they didn't put the ball in his hands. Against Washington, he was really inconsistent with pressure in his face. His accuracy was off, and it's not like they were throwing a lot of passes downfield. He was throwing the ball in the dirt to receivers when they were just doing curls or hitches. It's just, when I'm looking at J.J. McCarthy, I see a quarterback that is really, really streaky. As I said in my strengths, he is a rhythmatic passer. You have to get him in rhythm early. You got to get him starting hot fast. If he starts out 4-for-4, 5-for-5, 6-for-6, he's going to have a good game. But if he starts out 1-of-5 passing... 
You're not going to get too much out of them that afternoon. Against Washington, I was really disappointed. Washington's defense wasn't good. Their defense was mid at best last year. And he just looked awful. Awful. His best play was when he threw a dig to Roman Wilson on the third down. And late in the game, he had a big run on third and eight, which kept the drive alive for Michigan. Other than those two plays, there was nothing to really take away from that Washington out and out of JJ and say, oh yeah, this dude deserves to be a first round pick. Overall, I think JJ McCarthy is a decent quarterback prospect. He's my seventh ranked quarterback in this year's draft class. He is going to be a first round pick. I wouldn't take him in the first round because the ceiling is high. If he can end up putting it all together in the NFL, he definitely has the ceiling of being an elite quarterback. Great arm, throws with great velocity, really good athlete. You know, he could be a baby version of Josh Shalin in a sense. He does have a little bit of that ability when he runs with the football, that guys bounce off him. He is a really physical runner, but he also does have a deceptive amount of elusiveness in his game, similar to Josh Allen. And when he gets in rhythm and, you know, his timing is right, his footwork is right, he's really good. Like, watch those first five games of last year out of J.J. McCarthy. I was really shocked. I was like, okay, if this is the film that these GMs and scouts are turning on, and they're watching out of J.J. McCarthy, then I understand why they may be willing to trade up so much to get him because he looked outstanding. He looked so different in those games where he didn't play good teams compared to when he played against Penn State or Ohio State. Even Iowa in the Big Ten Championship game, I wasn't that impressed. J.J. McCarthy, you're getting a guy that has a high ceiling, but really low floor. And when I say really low floor, like, he could be a backup. But personally, my prediction or my projection for J.J. McCarthy's career, I think he's going to be an average starter. You know, he's going to be around a top 15, top 20 quarterback at his best. But he is going to be one of those dudes that, He's not going to lose you a lot of games, but he's not going to win you a lot of games neither. You know, I do think that he has the tendency to be a check down Charlie, and you do have to scheme guys open for him, giving some easy throws early because he's streaky. He's just not really consistent. He doesn't have a large sample size of throwing the football a lot in games, and the last time he was asked to throw the football, 40 plus or 30 plus in the game, they lost to TCU. And that game was a missed bag. I'm not a hater of JJ McCarthy. I'm just more skeptical of him than I am optimistic about him. But I understand what these GMs, what these scouts see in him. All right, if you're turning on JJ McCarthy and you're watching him against Michigan State, Rutgers or Eastern Carolina you see a quarterback that you definitely could envision being one of the best in the game at the next level but if you turn on you watch Penn State Ohio State in the last couple of games of the year you see a QB that isn't worth more than a second round pick truthfully so this is my J.J. McCarthy prospect breakdown in scouting report Leave your thoughts on how you feel about J.J. McCarthy in the comment section down below because I'm really interested in seeing how this dude's career plays out because there's been a lot of instances where the fans have said that a dude wasn't going to be good and he panned out to not be good at all. So fans, to our credit, we do have a good understanding of when a dude just flat out can't play. We were right about Mr. Trubisky. We were right about Deshaun Kaiser, and we might be right about Will Levis again. Because Will Levis, remember, he was another dude who they were hyping up. Shout out to all of you guys that were too, that are tuned in to the live chat. Shout out to my guy, Dubs, a hundo. He says, JT, salute, bro. Salute to you. 
hit that like button, subscribe to the channel. Remember that we're not just a YouTube channel. We are a podcast and you can find this episode along with the others in audio format on all podcasting platforms, Apple, Google, Spotify, Amazon, wherever you get your podcast from, the JT Sports Podcast is available. We got more on tonight's episode of the pod. The college football world is sleeping on Shadur Sanders, man. You guys would not believe where I saw Shadur Sanders rank as far as top 10 quarterbacks in college football, man. ESPN had their college football reporters rank all of the top returning QBs in the sport this year. And they did an awful job at doing it. I might have to release my top 10 rankings because it was a travesty. And some of the dudes they have over Shadur Sanders, just absolutely nasty work on their part. I got some thoughts on the Miami Hurricanes. I'm always surprised at the amount of Hurricane fans that exist in this world because the program has been down for so long. You would think that the popularity of it would be so low, but... I just seem to always just bump into Hurricane fans. The Carolina Panthers free agency moves. How improved are they? Did they make some good signings? The Jaguars extended Josh Allen, their star pass rusher. They gave him a five-year, $141 million deal with $88 million guaranteed. But was it an overpay? Was it a bad decision to give him so much money knowing that he only had one year of high-end elite production hit that like button subscribe to the channel you're listening to the jt sports podcast and i'm your host jt <clears throat> okay so espn Put a lot of disrespect on Shadur Sanders' name, man. So they had their college football reporters rank the top 10 quarterbacks in the sport for this upcoming season, right? And do you know where they ranked Shadur? Eighth. Are you kidding me? You rank Shadur Sanders eighth? They have Quinn Ewers, Jalen Milrow, Jackson Dart, Carson Beck, Noah Fafita, Rank the head of Shadur Sanders. And this isn't the first time I've seen this. When I've seen 247 Sports release their Heisman rankings, they have Shadur Sanders like 8th or nine. with guys like Quinn Ewers ahead of him. The national media is sleeping dead good on Shadur Sanders this year. You want to know something that's even more insane? If you go to DraftKings... And you go to their Heisman odds. If you put $20 on Shadur Sanders to win a Heisman this year, you could walk away with $920. He has plus, what, 4,500 4, odds to win the award? To me, Shadur Sanders is a lock to win Heisman this year. Okay, I don't see how he doesn't win it. He's going to have a better offensive line. He had a 27-3 touchdown ratio last year behind the worst old line in America. Imagine what he's going to do now behind our average offensive line. This dude's going to cook. And then he has a ton of great receivers. They got LeJonte Western, who was a star wide out at Florida Atlantic. He was top three. And every statistical category last year in yards, receiving yards, what, receptions, touchdowns, and then you pair him up with Travis Hunter? I mean, come on. There's so much talent that Shadur Sanders has around him at Colorado going into next season. It's going to be damn near impossible for him to at least not be a Heisman finalist this year. I'm really shocked that the amount of people that think that Shadur Sanders is not good, he's overhyped, he's overrated, 27 to 3 touchdown interception ratio is really impressive, and he completed nearly 70% of his passes last year, that's really hard to do, considering the situation that he had, this year, Shadur Sanders is going to wake a lot of you doubters up, 
Because I know there's a lot of you guys doubting Shadur, a lot of you guys hating on him. Y'all gotta get that haterade out of your system, man. Get that haterade out of your heart. It's not good for you. When I watched Shadur last year, I saw an NFL quarterback. I saw somebody that did a really good job of going through his progressions, making the right reads with the football. He also was really clutch. And the only reason Colorado won four games last year was because they had Shadur at quarterback. You take Shadur off of last year's Colorado team, not only do they go winless, but they lose every game by more than at least three touchdowns. If Shadur Sanders was the starting quarterback for Alabama last year instead of Jalen Milrow, Alabama would have won it all. Truthfully, Jalen Milrow... ESPN has him ranked over Shadur Sanders and their top 10 returning quarterback rankings. Are you serious? Jalen Milrow? Listen, I like Jalen Milrow a lot, but he's nowhere as good as what Shadur is, especially when it comes to throwing the football. I've never seen a quarterback throw a more accurate deep ball than they do short and intermediate passes. And Jalen Milrow definitely is going to improve under Kalen DeBoer, but Last year, he held Alabama back. Alabama would have loved to have Shadur Sanders. Imagine if Texas had Shadur Sanders. They would have won it all, too. They would have went undefeated. Quinn Ewers is the most overrated quarterback in college football right now. Shadur Sanders clearly is the best quarterback coming into the upcoming 2024 college football season. He's going to be... Expected to be a top three pick in next year's draft for a very good reason. He's already an NFL quarterback. Quinn Ewers, Jalen Milrow, Carson Beck, those guys are a step below Shadur Sanders. Y'all really need to stop hating and stop sleeping on Shadur Sanders. Like, I really don't understand why so many people just don't think he's that good. I remember last offseason, I told you guys that he was going to be one of the best quarterbacks in college football, and y'all were talking about some, oh, man, like, this, this dude did that at Jackson State. It's such a different level when you're going from FCS playing HBCUs to playing big boys and power five football. And then all Shadur Sanders does is proceed to have one of the best touchdown and interception ratios in the nation behind one of the worst offensive lines in the sport, behind the rebuilding team. I, I can't wait for Shadur Sanders to wake y'all up this season. I really can't. And I got some more bold predictions for Shadur Sanders on the way. But just know, you know, DraftKings, if you put $20 on Shadur Sanders right now, you could win $920 when he wins the Heisman this year. Y'all sleeping on Shadur Sanders, but it's okay. Like, he's going to wake y'all up. The Buffs going to wake y'all up this year. They come and they finna kick the door down for show. Sure. You finna kick it down for show. Sure. You know, as a Miami Hurricane fan, I'm always surprised at the amount of fellow Miami Hurricane fans that I always bump into in public. And the reason why I'm always so surprised the see other Hurricane fans is because the football program has been down for so many years. It's just you would think the popularity and the support for the team would be very low. You would think that fans would be afraid to show themselves. But, you know, it's always really refreshing to see that I'm not the only Hurricane fan around. And I got a lot of pride in my Canes. You feel me? And we got a really underrated fan base. For this team to be as irrelevant as what they have been for the last couple of decades, we may not go to the games like that because we don't really get a good reason to go to the games. But there's been plenty of instances where Miami has had their moments of being good, such as 2017, where Hard Rock was sold out. In 2017, I remember when Miami played Notre Dame. That, that was the loudest that I've ever heard a Miami Hurricanes game, ever. And I was just watching it on television. Imagine how loud that Notre Dame-Miami Hurricanes 27 game was 
in person. So when Miami football is good, the fans support when they get a reason to go to support. And this season, Miami, this is the best team that they've had in a very long time. And I know Hurricane fans say that very often. It seems like nearly every year they're saying this this team is the best team we've had since 2000 and something. But when you look at 24-7 sports team talent composite rankings, they're top 10. They got a good offensive line, a good group of wide receivers. They should have a really good defense. The only difference between this year's Hurricanes team and past iterations of Miami Hurricanes football is that we got a true superstar at quarterback this year, and his name is Cam Ward. We thought we had that in Taylor Van Dyke. When you think about how good he was when he had to replace Derrick King, his red shirt freshman season. But then you get a new coaching staff in there, Red Lashley leaves, and he just didn't look the same. Same thing with Derrick King. We thought Derrick King was going to be a superstar, and he couldn't stay healthy. This is the year, though, that Miami really makes some noise that this great program returns to glory. Everybody's going to be talking about Miami Hurricanes football this year, man, because you're going to have a quarterback that has a really good chance of being a Heisman finalist this year and pulling up a lot of high, fantastic numbers in this Shannon Dawson offense. He has an air raid offense. I'm pretty sure he's trying to sling that rock all over the yard and run it occasionally from time to time. But Miami Hurricane fans, I believe this is the year that we finally get rewarded for our patience and our willingness to go through all this hardship. Like, when you go on Instagram, X, there's a really big Miami Hurricanes community. Even on YouTube, I remember when I started out first doing YouTube, I initially was covering Miami Hurricanes football. And I met so many people via the Miami Hurricanes just talking about the team. You know, and this is a really passionate fan base, a fan base that has a desire to want to do anything that it takes for this team to win. You know, they got a really good alumni base. The fan base always buys a lot of merchandise. I always see a lot of people rocking my Hurricanes gear. That's why I always ask them, hey, you a Hurricanes fan? I had a homie that I met the day at FAU who's a Hurricane fan that I had class with for like two semesters, and I never knew he was a Hurricanes fan until today. I was like, bro, I, I see you sporting that Miami Hurricanes jacket. Like, what's up with that? You a Canes fan? He was like, hell yeah, I'm a Miami Hurricanes fan. I was like, are you kidding me? Like, I just get so surprised at the amount of Miami Hurricanes fans there are because this program has been down for so many years that you would think this fan base is extinct. And it's not just in South Florida. This is all across the world. Like, I've traveled to a few different states, met a few couple of different people not from Florida that are Hurricane fans. Are you kidding me? Like, we, we got to have the most underrated fan base in college football. For this fan base to be as big as what it is and Miami to be as down for as long as what they've been, you can't tell me, Miami Hurricane fans, we don't go hard for our football team, bro. We love our school. Like, after attendance, we've shown when the team is good, we go watch the games. There's no point going to watch us play when we're not good. You, you think there's a reason to go watch Miami play a game against Georgia Tech? I mean, when, when you know they're going to lose, you know they're going to find a dumb way to F up a win? Come on, man. Like, Miami Hurricane fans, we need to pat ourselves on the back. We're one of the most loyalist fan base, one of the most passionate fan bases in college football. And, you know, I'm glad to be a part of such a great and such a strong fan base. And I can't wait for us to kick some ass this season. Like, I really believe this is the year that the Miami Hurricanes are going to come back and really make their presence felt in college football again. We got talent. We got money. We got a quarterback now. The Canes are coming in 2024, man. I'm trying to tell y'all. I'm really in the merchant. I want to talk about the Carolina Panthers free agency moves because I got a lot of 
mixed emotions about, you know, the moves they decided to make. And I don't really know what direction they're trying to go. All right. Offensively, I like the signings of offensive guards, Robert Hunt and Damian Lewis. Both of these two offensive guards are going to be tremendous upgrades on the interior of Carolina's offensive line, which was the biggest problem on their O-line last year. Robert Hunt, you gave him a five-year, $100 million deal. That could be a little bit of an overpay, but he was the second-best offensive lineman that the Miami Dolphins had behind their left tackle who can never stay healthy. Damian Lewis, he's a really good addition to the Carolina Panthers. He's probably going to be playing right guard. Tackle, you should be straight at tackle. Akima Kwanu, this dude has had a really weird career. Like, his rookie season was pretty good. Year two, and eh, last year, eh, I'm like, what's going on with you? But with the new coaching staff, a better offensive line coach, Akima Kwanu, I don't believe he's a lost cause, at least not just yet. Taylor Morton is one of the better right tackles in the league, and he got an extension not too long ago. All you really needed to do was improve the interior of the offensive line. My favorite move that the Carolina Panthers made was trading for Deontay Johnson. You guys saw my reaction. I was really hurt to see the Steelers trading away my favorite player on the team. What Deontay Johnson is going to bring to the Panthers' offense is what they were severely lacking last year, a wide receiver who knows how to get effing open, who can create separation and get off the line of scrimmage. That's what you're going to get out of Deontay Johnson. He possibly could give you 1,200 receiving yards this year. He could do for Bryce Young what Stephon Diggs did for Josh Allen early into his career with the Buffalo Bills. When they traded for Stephon Diggs, Josh Allen, he ascended for being a really good young quarterback to becoming one of the best in the game. That's what having a really good young receiver can do for a young quarterback. Deontay Johnson, he hasn't really had the greatest numbers, but it's been more due to injuries and lackluster quarterback play. Bryce Young is going to do good with Deontay Johnson and Dave Canales system that's all about you know, timing, rhythm, and getting the ball out fast. I like the decision to trade for Deontay Johnson. All you gave up was Dante Jackson, who fans, you guys aren't low on him, but you guys feel like he was replaceable in the sixth-round pick. Where my problem lies with the Carolina Panthers' free agency moves, though, and where I say I have a mixed bag when it comes to how I feel about them, their defense got tremendously worse. Okay, I mean, you lost Frankie Aluvu, who was nearly the heart and soul of your defense. Yes, you did retain Derrick Brown. You gave him a long-term extension, but you lost Gross Matus, who could have been a really good deaf guy, and potentially he was on his way to becoming maybe a 6'7 sack guy for you. And you replace him with Jadavion Kleine. You signed him on a two-year deal, but... I don't know if Jadavion Clowney is even going to be productive for you this season. Last year with Baltimore, he had the best season of his career. But you see, the problem with, with Jadavion Clowney is that he's really inconsistent. Everywhere he's been in his career, he's never been the same player throughout. When he got traded from Houston to Seattle, you know, he had a, a up and down tenure there. You know, he's just one of those guys that he just has random years when he's good and random years where you don't hear about him at all. So if you're looking at somebody who can improve your pass rush, I don't think Jadavion Clowney can be that guy for you. Sean Robinson is a really underrated interior defense alignment. Pairing him on the inside with Derrick Brown, that's going to be nasty. But linebacker Josie Jewell, that's a downgrade from Frankie Oluva, man. He's nowhere close to as good as what Frankie Oluva was. Then you sign Caleb Vaughn chasing. It doesn't matter if the dude's just going to be brought in to be a backup piece. Like, this dude hasn't shown to be an NFL quality pass rusher. The Jaguars took him in the first round. He quietly is one of the biggest busts in recent memory. He has to be one of the five biggest busts, in the, at least from the 2010s. 
Like, Caleb on chasing this dude doesn't even have nearly any numbers at all. So I, I don't know what the Carolina Panthers are doing on the defensive side of things. They signed a couple of defensive backs also, but that defense, I'd be surprised if that defense is as good this season as what it was in 2023 and even 2022. They do got a really good defensive coordinator. All right, Ijaro Evero, he is a stud. He is one of the best defensive coordinators in the game, at least one of the best up-and-coming runs. And he could have left Carolina to take other D coordinator jobs. And he also was, you know, being mentioned in the breath for a couple of head coaching interviews also. But he chose to remain with Carolina. They made it a priority to retain him. But I like what Carolina is doing on the offense I don't really agree with the direction that they're going on defense, but those are my thoughts on the Carolina Panthers free agency moves as we approach this year's NFL draft. The Jacksonville Jaguars have finally extended one of their former first round picks, Josh Allen. They're assigning him to a five year deal worth $141 million, $88 million fully guaranteed. Jaguar fans are split on this extension, all right? On one side, you have the group of people that say we had to extend Josh Allen because we have a really lengthy history of not extending our first-round picks. Josh Allen would be the first first-rounder that the Jaguars have extended in a very long time since Blake Bortles. You feel me? And plus, he's coming off the best season of his career. He had 18 and a half sacks. The problem with the people who say that, you know, oh, this is a massive overpay for Jacksonville is that Jacksonville had a chance to get this dude for way less. They were supposed to come to the negotiating table and get a long-term deal worked out for Josh Allen before last season started. But you see, they played around. And, you know, Josh Allen said, all right, you guys are going to give me a long-term extension. I ain't going to hold out into the season. I'm just going to F around and show y'all why I'm worth the money that I want. Not only did he do that, but he did himself an even bigger service because he made more money. Now, instead of getting him for less, you got to pay more. So this is the necessary price the Jaguars were going to have to dish out for Josh Allen. This is what happens when you bet on yourself. When you bet on yourself and it pays off, you stay healthy, you end up making more money. That's what happened to Josh Allen. And the Jaguars have to pay him more. Of course he wasn't going to take no hometown discount. You could have got him for a discount if you would have signed them before the start of 2023, but you didn't. So you have to F around, find out, the dude put up 18 and a half sacks, and you have to pay him accordingly. He's now the second highest paid pass rusher behind Nick Bosa. Brian Burns is third. And I'm not talking about average yearly salary. I'm just talking about the total worth of this deal. Nick Bosa's deal is worth like 170. So that's like 30 something million more than what Josh Allen is making. But Josh Allen. This definitely is a new record-changing contract for him, in a sense, because he resets the market. You know, Brian Burns kind of already reset the market, but Josh Allen, he resets the market again, because I don't view him as a A-tier pass rusher like I do TJ Watt and Miles Mer- Garrett. So those guys... When they go and they get new deals done, they're going to have to definitely be making more than Josh Allen. And if Nick Bosa already is making $170 million, TJ Watt, Miles Garrett, when they get new deals, they could be in the $200 million range. If Josh Allen and Brian Burns are getting 140 to 150 Jacksonville, for them, you know, and the people that say that, oh, well, this was a bad move, I kind of see where you're coming from, and I do somewhat agree with you. You see, Josh Allen, if you would have let him walk, you would have had the ability to sign more players to fill more holes on your roster because you still don't have a true number one wide receiver, your offensive line still is eh, and your defense still needs a little bit more work. 
And when you're investing so much money into Josh Allen and he's going to be taking up so much cap space and then you have to get a long-term deal worked out with Trevor Lawrence, these two guys are going to be taking a big portion of the salary cap. For the next four years, Josh Allen's cap hit 11.5 this year, 39.4 in 2025, 29.4 million in 2026 and 31.1 million in 2027 and he does well they do have a potential out in that year let's say it doesn't work out they can choose to get out of that and they don't have to take any dead cap hit at all but it kind of is risky paying this dude so much money based on what he did last year even though it kind of is your fault you had to pay this much money because you could have got him for less if you would have locked him up long term last year but you played around he had a good season and you have to play pay him accordingly Josh Allen can he keep up this production I don't think he's going to be a consistent 18 and a half sack guy he definitely will come back down to earth a little bit but he definitely is good enough to give you double-digit sacks every single season. His first year in the league, he had 10 and a half sacks. Second season, he got injured. The next two years, he had around seven sacks. Those are decent numbers. And then you got to think with him having to deal with coaching turnover, having to get acclimated to a new scheme. You got Trayvon Walker coming on. That can help Josh Allen. Josh Allen... I don't think this is going to be a deal that Jacksonville is going to look back and they're going to regret. I feel they should be being really happy. They should feel really happy right now that they finally were able to secure one of their former first round picks to a long term deal because the last couple of first round picks they've had, they've not made it to second contracts with Jacksonville. This is a big win for Jacksonville and the franchise retaining Josh Allen. I'm glad they were able to get the deal done. Yes, it is a lot of money to invest into a dude like this, but having a good edge rusher, even if they're a beer, a B tier edge rusher like Josh Allen, they still are a really valuable piece to having a championship team. It's a quarterback driven league. All right, quarterbacks are making more money than anybody. Who affects the game more? Other than QBs, edge rushers, and offensive tackles. That's why they're getting paid so much money. You got to get after the quarterback. You got to affect them somehow. How are you going to stop them if you don't have high-end pass rushers? That's why they make so much money. As a passing league, you got you got to get guys who can impact the passing game. That's what Josh Allen does. That's why he's getting so much. This is it for this episode of the JT Sports Podcast. I appreciate you guys for tuning in. If you guys enjoyed this episode, leave a like, subscribe to the channel. We'll greatly appreciate it. Give us a five-star review on Apple and Spotify. If you want to support the podcast, the best way you can do so, and it's free, give us a five-star review on Apple and Spotify. Greatly helps us out a lot. If you have a question that you would like answered on a future episode, you can submit them on Instagram and X at JT Sports underscore is our Instagram handle and at JT Sports underscore is where you can find us on X. We will be doing another mailback episode in a couple of days. If you want to get one of your questions answered, all you got to do is send them in on X and Instagram. Shout out to everybody that's tuned in to the live chat on YouTube. Shout out to Kate Rowan. Shout out to my guy, Meanzo. I appreciate everybody for tuning in. I'm aiming to live stream again this Friday. We'll see, though. But I am going live with college football with Sam tomorrow. So be on the lookout for that. I'm going to post it in the community tab. But I appreciate everybody for tuning in.